Hello and welcome to the Funbox Forward podcast. It's June at the time of this recording, and in addition to being Pride Month, this also happens to be Black Music History Month. So today, we'd like to honor this by sharing a brief history about Black music and its impact, not just on music itself, but on how Black music impacts the realm of small business. We'll even suggest some tips for entrepreneurs and others who want a piece of the music business action. And so to talk about this, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest, Akeem Bryant. He's head of R&B programming at Pandora, one of the leaders in streaming music. Akeem is an entertainment media professional with an extensive expertise in media relations, including creative writing, artist booking, and content programming. Akeem is also a small business owner himself. He's an author. He's not only an accomplished music journalist, but also a published independent novelist. So thank you, Akeem, for joining us. It is my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks. It's an understatement that music has been and continues to be big business. So let's shift gears now and talk about small businesses and the many ways that they and even individuals can participate in the music industry today. What are some common ways that people can earn a living in the music industry? The music industry is a lot broader than people just imagine from hearing about record labels and artists. Absolutely. I mean, that's kind of how I got into the business because Mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out early on what I wanted to do, you know, what field did I want to go into? You know, originally it was audio recording and engineering. That's how I found my path. But just, yeah, just generally, there are so many areas of music, anywhere from songwriting and publishing, Mm -hmm. you know, you have production, of course, you can be a label owner, music video director. And even music therapists or music teachers and tutors and instrument rental and repair services. And these are small businesses that seem to be on the fringe of the music industry, but are still very vital to it because they feed the musicians that are serving it. From your experience in business and as a business owner, what are three business tips or words of advice you can offer to small businesses that are in the music industry? From my experience, it is necessary to figure out what type of music you want to put forth first before you start to experiment Mm -hmm. into all different, you know, other genres and areas, because what you can quickly do is alienate the audience that you've gained based off of one sound. And then you've gone and moved on to a new sound. And now you have to, you know, build a whole new fan base based on that new sound. Yeah. They're all, there's, it's a common complaint in a lot of music genres where their, their old stuff was better yeah exactly (laughs) exactly you want to yeah you want to not fall into into that trap um and then also too don't rely so heavily on a distributor Mm -hmm. their job is to distribute the music and a lot of times you will get a distribution deal that does not include marketing and promotion does not include pr does not include anything extra their only job is to distribute the music far and wide to the Pandora, Spotify's, and Apple's of the world. Um, and that's where it stops. Mm-hmm. And even if you have a deal that does include marketing and, and promotion, do not rely specifically on them to do all the work. You know, we're in the independent right. era. Um, this is the age of independence. It is necessary to find out who your fan base is, who they are, target them. Mm-hmm learn how to target them, learn what parts of the country love you more than other parts. Yeah, promote yourself. You know, It's your job too to yeah. get your brand out there through marketing and self-promotion, whether you're an artist or a producer. Don't just rely yeah. on the label. But if you're a small business or entrepreneur who's not on the artist side, yeah. what other business advice do you have for them? In the era of independence, collaboration is important. I think finding those companies that might be a little similar to what you do or those other companies that will complement what it is you do and working together toward a common goal. No one can do it on their own. Mm -hmm. It requires a village. It requires a, a team. And the more people you can bring into your circle to help push your message, um, to help push your business, the better. 
That's great. Now for musicians or artists or even service providers, what are your recommendations for doing business with Pandora or other streaming services? How can small businesses play a role in the ecosystem of Pandora? Yeah, so as far as the ecosystem at Pandora, we've actually created this um, content creator tool, which is known as AMP, A-M-P. Mm-hmm. And AMP is actually what the internal curators like myself use to program the music, but it's also available to the entire community of, of music heads, essentially. Um, so basically, you can go on to that platform, you can create a profile, you can claim um, your artist that you represent, um, whether it's yourself as the artist or if you're a manager who you know, wants to maintain this tool um, for the artist or if you're in production um, or if you're from you know, the label aspect, even if it's an independent label, but the tool is available to, to everyone. And what you can do is run, you can run promos in the system um, against your music so that when people hear your music, they're also hearing your voice. You can, you know, leave mm-hmm. a message in terms of where you're going to be touring next. It's a really good tool. And then you can also, you can also feature certain tracks. So you can go into the system and, and pick, you know, a song that you feel like you want to be the biggest focus and you can feature that track. And then the algorithm will pick it up in rotation and in spins and streams and highlight it essentially. You know, we want everybody to hear the new music and because Pandora itself is very um, personalized. So the more, you know, the more you listen to it, the more you use the thumbs to figure out what you like and don't like, it's going to give you more of what you do like. As curation, we're always trying to break through the algorithm to get new music and get something new in front of the listener. Great. Yeah. Thumbs matter. Yes. <laughs> Akeem, when you and I spoke before about Black Music History Month, you said something really key, and that was that all music is Black music. Mm. Now, tell us more about that. Yes. So that's actually a, a podcast that we just recently launched for Black Music Month, and the entire marketing campaign is one of the focal points. Um, so basically... It is exploring that concept of all music being Black music. Essentially, how music was coming together in the early days, a large part of it was, you know, coming from the Black experience, coming from Black culture, and just, you know, this podcast, this concept is essentially connecting the dots um, throughout the decades. And it's a, a partnership, actually, that we established with the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, So, you know, in partnership with them is, you know, where the concept came from and the imaging and the content. Um, We have two episodes up at the moment. There's one with Kelly Rowland and one with Neo. Um, And again, just talking about the, the depth of Black music over the years. Those are great points. And, you know, Black music history is such a huge topic. I mean, there are Netflix series about it, countless books, and I've even seen PhD studies about it. So in the short time that we have together, let's narrow the focus down to your specialty at Pandora, R&B, rhythm and blues. Uh, Tell us a little bit about the history of R&B, and then bring us up to date with R&B over the last 20 years or so. Yes. So historically, you know, the rhythm and blues comes out of the blues. Talking about the 1950s, artists like Sam Cooke kind of laying the foundation of of what we know, you know, R&B to be today. Most recently actually launched a Black Music Forever station. It covers a, a, about 10 to 12 different styles of Black music over the, over the decades. Mm-hmm. When it comes to, to Black music, you know, it, especially when it comes to R&B, which is my personal specialty. It's the music I grew up on. I love with all of my heart. Um, it's the reason why I fell in love with music. Over, I would say over the past 20 years, it has really, it's changed a lot. It's mm-hmm. a lot different now than what, you know, traditionally we know R&B music to be. Um, mm-hmm. There's the influence of hip hop that has, you know, tremendously impacted the genre. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think in the early 2000s, there was this kind of balance between hip hop and R&B where you had a lot of songs, a lot of R&B songs that were being released featuring rappers. Um, and then as we saw kind of around the 2010s is that flipped and, you know, hip, it was more so hip hop songs featuring R&B singers. Um, and we're kind of still in that phase today somewhat with the, you know, the influence of trap music and, um, you know, especially everything that's coming out of Atlanta, which is essentially the hub of much of hip hop and R&B music um, today. So, yeah, it's it's one big story, essentially, of a genre that continues to grow and evolve. And I'm interested to see, I'm actually interested to see where it goes from here. Uh, what do you think was the big change in terms of sound? I, I've noticed that even lately, R&B is a lot more soulful than it was. Have you seen it sort of change in terms of moods between what was typically R&B in the 20th century versus what it is now? Yes, there is a big transition that's happening right now. Um, I do have to kind of take a step back and acknowledge that um, there is racism in America, unfortunately. Um, and that was a large part of the reason why there was such a disdain for disco music back in the 70s. It was part of the reason why there was, you know, such massive protests of people going out into the streets, burning their vinyl, you know, their disco vinyl and, and mm -hmm. things like that. So it did affect the, the music. It did affect the R&B genre as a whole. And it became a little slower. It became more soulful, um, became more about really, truly about the vocals, especially in the 80s. And in the 90s, you know, we had the influence of hip hop that came along. And most recently, yes, I think the soul is starting to come back into the genre. Um, I think we lost it a little mm -hmm. bit for at least 10 years um, due to the fact that hip hop was so dominant, you know, around the 2010s, where there was a lot of talk about R&B being dead. R&B is dead, like it's over. And the, the challenge is getting people to understand the differences between hip hop and R&B and they are not the same music. Mm -hmm. um, and then making space for both of them to exist. It's been around for seven decades. Yeah, those are great points. So what's different on the business side of R&B as far as music artists, producers, and promoters? Because I imagine the days of working only with big record labels and A&R management seem like they're thinning out, especially with home studio, online production, and social media. It seems like there's a lot more accessibility to the music industry from all sides now. How is this impacting the music business? Yeah, it's having a huge impact on the business of music because the labels are not, the major labels are not as necessary as they used to be. Mm -hmm. The one thing that is still an absolute is that distribution is king. So in an era now where there is so much noise, um, there, you know, pretty much anyone who decides, you know, to get into music can, you know, find a studio or create their own studio, create some songs, put it out on the internet, find a fan base, begin to grow that fan base, attract the attention of a number of different labels, go through the process of, of figuring out, you know, which label you actually want to sign to. And then, you know, coming down to the contract, artists like a Chance the Rapper, artists like an Eric Bellinger, who is big in the indie R&B scene, mm -hmm. they are, you know, totally independent, but they are maintaining their ownership of their music. Um, they're maintaining the way in which it is marketed and promoted. They're mm -hmm. just using the major labels or whatever distribution deal that they have for distribution just to actually right. reach the masses because that is one thing that the labels still you know, have a monopoly on because if you are independent, it's going to be difficult to reach millions of people as an independent. Um, right. you know, it's, it costs a lot of money to run these ads on on the internet and Facebook and everything like that. So distribution is still king. 
On a more personal note, I, I know that programming for Pandora isn't your only career. Small business is actually in your own DNA. Not only are you an independent journalist, you're a published author too. And you have a debut trilogy titled Stuck Pages. So tell us about that and what it's like to work as an author, as a side gig. How did you come to be an author? What's your What's been your journey? Yes. So... Music and writing have always been two of my biggest passions in life. Early on as a kid, that's, you know, I was always in front of the radio. And if I wasn't in front of the radio, you know, I would be writing poems in class. Um, you know, it was just always something I was into. Um, and so figuring out career-wise what I wanted to do, I'm like, music, writing, mm, let me go music because I want to actually make money. Um, and I know writing can be, you know, there's the whole starving artist concept out there that I really don't appreciate. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I went the, the music route, but then about 10, about 10 to 15 years ago, you know, the writing bug was, was eating me up and I just, I just had to do something. Um, so I started, you know, getting into journalism. I, um, took on a mentor, actually, Emil Wilbekin. He's, he was um, the former editor for Vibe Magazine back in the 90s. And, you know, Vibe Magazine was was a, a, a publication that I grew up on. And, you know, I would see his see him in the in the pages all the time and, you know, rubbing elbows with all these different celebrities and just seeing the content that was created in the pages and eventually got the chance to meet him um, later on in both of our careers and you know he he mentored me and then he gave me my first editor gig at blue magazine um mm -hmm. back in the day and and then you know he connected me with a number of different other um other contacts at different um different publications and um yeah and we're actually even connected still to this day um yes his, his native son organization, a nonprofit uh, for Black gay men mm -hmm. in entertainment. It is loosely based off of my life and my journey. You know, the main character, you know, he's, you know, fresh out of college, getting his first job in music, going into programming for a radio station. Um, but what I wanted to do ultimately was to give a 360 degree view of this character so that it wasn't just about his job or wasn't just about, you know, all of the celebrities, maybe he, you know, was hanging out around, that it was about family, that it was about friends, um, you know, just getting to understand what Quincy Simmons was like in all these different areas and how he was able to code switch on some level so that, mm -hmm. you know, he was, you know, when he was with his friends, there was, you know, one type of vernacular where, Whereas when he's with his when he's with his mom, it's it's something completely different. You know, it's a lot more relaxed and chill. Yeah, and then overall, throughout the trilogy, it is the journey of a heartbreaker. I wanted the story, you know, the first book to be the the prequel to him becoming the heartbreaker. Second book is him as the heartbreaker, and then third book would be about forgiveness, which is um, what I'm still in the midst of of writing. But yeah, just I just felt like, especially as a black gay male, it was important for me to to write this story, which essentially is the story I wish I had available to me as a young man growing up. So. Yeah, that's great because it's incredibly relatable as well. Everyone can relate to it. Yeah. Well, as a small business owner, what's one lesson that that's taught you about running a small business? Yes, I think early on. I was focused on trying to reach as many people as possible and just realizing now, you know, after a number of years, I'm working with a business manager as well. You know, we have a team of, you know, a designer We, in terms of how the books are designed, um, in terms of the book covers and the graphics, PR and marketing and, and all these different people who are helping me present this story and present this trilogy in the best way possible. But mm -hmm. what I've learned is it's best to, to target your audience as much as possible. Uh -huh. to, so for me, I've figured out um, through, you know, all of my connections, 
followed by, you know, family and friends who have, you know, read copies of, of the book is that black gay men are going to be a target for me. And mm-hmm. also black women um, are going to be a major target as well. And that doesn't mean that I'm not reaching people outside of these groups. It just means in terms of the targeting, in terms of where the money is going and how we're actually going to, to promote this, those are the targeted audiences. Right. It's not just about those two audiences that I that I think are gonna, you know, relate the most. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to business, yeah, the the more you can target, the better. Great. Yeah, that's good advice. Akeem, thank you so much for joining us and happy Pride Month. And of course, happy Black Music History Month. I'd like to share some information about how listeners can find you and learn more about your work. Yes, absolutely. They can um, go to StuckPages.com. And then I'm also on Twitter and IG under StuckPages handle. And that is, yeah, and hit me up, DM me. I'm ready. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge about R&B and of course your insights to business to realize that it's a bigger business than people think, even for small businesses. So thanks again, Akeem. Thank you so much. I appreciate all the, all of everything, the entire opportunity. All right. You bet. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And thank all of you that are listening to us on the Funbox Forward podcast. I'm your host, Dan Bevener, and feel free to check out our blog at funbox.com slash blog. And of course, all of our other podcasts, which are available on the usual podcast outlets. And you can even visit our resources section at funbox.com slash resources. You see lots more information, both in terms of videos and audio, and of course, lots of guides to help you as a small business owner. Thanks again from the Funbox Forward Podcast.